All right, please tell me if you can see and hear me. Let's try this. Oh, okay. Yay! All right. So, um, yeah, so the excitement today was that I lost all power and internet, which was great timing for the online conference, right? Uh, and it only came back just not that long ago. Uh, and so, yeah, so I'm still kind of getting things put back together. So I apologize for that. Thank you so much for sticking around. Now, let's go do something really cool and, uh, and here. <laughs> so real quickly, as we are, are just getting started here. Yeah, this is the Velociraptors Are Broken panel. So if you're, if, that, if that's where you wanted to be, congratulations. If not, hit, uh, oh, whatever the command is. Oh, hold on, hang on. I've got, I've got something to tell me that, hopefully. Sorry, I am completely uh, discombobulated now that my, <laughs> my, my, I came on and I had no camera. All right. Um, so yay. All right, let's get going. Um, so I'm Laura Van Arendonkbaugh. I am going to be doing this. There is lots of other stuff going on all weekend. Please, if you write it in here, make sure you reload, uh, without the referral tag. We're trying to get Twitch to see that we really do have, uh, real live people here. Um, so load, uh, it should say, Right here, I should say that just my URL without the rated tag at the end. So, okay. And just real quickly, I do have closed captioning turned on for this stream. It doesn't really like the way I talk, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so my replay does have human reviewed captions. So uh, if, you, if you need that, please check that afterward. The replay on YouTube will have human reviewed captions. Okay. Now let's get in and get going because we have plenty of stuff to do here. So this is the other title <laughs> for this uh, for this uh, presentation is is you know the Velociraptors are broken is the fun way to say that. Why books and movies make behavior people really annoyed is a slightly more accurate thing. This is basically just me going on a soapbox for the next hour. Buckle up, get snacks. We're not stopping the car for toilet breaks. I'm sorry. Okay, here's the thing. Uh, <laughs> here's the thing. People tend to absorb pop culture without necessarily realizing it, and they tend to assume things. So, you know, oh, well, everybody knows that usually means you haven't bothered to look it up, okay? Um, and, and so bad information just gets passed from fiction piece to fiction piece to fiction piece because I saw it in a movie, so it must be true. So I put it in my book, so the next person puts it in the next, next book and, and such. So quite a lot of things that are just default or that are assumed to be facts are completely bogus and in some cases really silly. Um, and so what I'm going to hear to, to, what I'm here to do is um, make you look smarter and also make your stories more effective because frequently the real science is so much cooler than what has been passed around in the world of fiction. Uh, and you know, you're, you're writing a monster that's supposed to be scary. It's kind of ridiculous, but if you use stuff that actually is terrifying in real life, it will be terrifying on your page or on your screen or in your game. So hopefully that gives you a little bit about where we're going with this. Um, so that's, that's the plan. So real quickly, why do I get to talk about this? Um, it's not just because I have opinions, although that is true too. Uh, my day job is in animal behavior and training. Uh, I'm certified in tag teach, which is also human behavior and training. Uh, I am a best-selling author in this subject. I am an international speaker. I'm faculty for an international certification body. Guys, this is the stuff that I actually know and do, and I am full of opinions on it. <laughs> so, so buckle up. Here we go. Okay. Let's start with, I'm just gonna poke some holes in some really favorite fiction tropes, and then we'll talk about what we can do that's that's better and, and how to pull out better things. But I'm gonna start with just getting on my soapbox and going. Paranormal romance writers, I'm so sorry. This might be a great time for you to check another channel. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna go in here and say, Guys, the concept of the alpha wolf as it appears in most fiction, it it doesn't exist. Okay, it just doesn't. It do, just no, okay? It's just no. Um, 
most of what people will talk about as being, you know, alpha wolf behavior or wolf pack hierarchies and all of that sort of thing, uh, they came from some extremely poorly run studies uh, back in the 1940s, so long, long ago. Uh, the studies were absolutely discredited and abandoned by the 1950s. The only place they will ever have any gasp of life left is in really bad dog training today. Um, and people will cite, oh, this is, you know, dogs can't walk in front of you because that means dominance and they can't eat before you because that's dominance and they can't sit on the couch because it's adding height and that's dominance. And all of this is completely bunk, like so much bunk. And if you don't want to believe me, that's fine. Believe Dr. Meck, who is one of the people who was talking about alpha wolves and has for decades uh, been saying, hey, that term that I invented that you're all using wrong, how about you don't, okay? Um, so an alpha wolf in, in actual meaning is, uh, there are two alphas and they are the breeding pair because a pack is a family unit, all right? So, oh no, okay. Oh no, my werewolf romance, the entirety of AO3. Yeah, AO3 just shivered and shut down. A million voices cried out. Yeah, all of that. Um, so yeah, this is, this is the thing. And, and uh, let me just give you the very short version. Packs are family units. Your pet dog living with you is not a pack animal because your family is not all the same species that are related to each other, okay? This is really important for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, if you contact me in a professional context and then you tell me that you're gonna make sure that you're the alpha uh, over your pet dog, I'm either going to assume you're ignorant or I need to call someone about some legal situations, okay? <laughs> like, it is a breeding pair. There you go. Um, and what that means though, is because all of that is based on bunk and it, you know, it's not scientifically valid, all the things that people try to pull in about, well, I need to eat first, I need to walk in front and you know, all of these things, alpha roles, God help us, um, actually do far more harm than good. Okay. They're not even useless, although they're that too, but they're actually harmful. So okay. So, uh, Cozy Rogers says, Hey, werewolves aren't technically wolves. So maybe. I hear what you're saying. Um, I personally am a fan. I like old school werewolves that are actual true wolves, but I'm fine with, I get like some people like the fuzzy biped kind of werewolf. Um, but this is not limited to wolves. This is pretty much all hierarchies. So we'll, we'll come around to that. So um, here we go. All right. So people are like, well, if there's not a pack hierarchy, then what kind of hierarchies do we have? And I'm going to say there is still you know, a structure, there's still a social structure and there is actually authority. So um, if, if this were a live conference, if we were all in the same room instead of uh, scattered on computers all over the planet, uh, and I said, okay, like, let's, let's actually talk about this. Everybody raise your right hand. If you want to, go ahead, okay, raise your right hand. And pretty much everybody raises their right hand. So in that moment, I had some form of authority. Is it because I am the baddest bad in the room? Okay, is it because I have some way to physically coerce you? No, it's because I have a resource. I'm speaking, I have information that is, you know, you would like, it'd be useful to you. And so because I have a resource that you would like access to, I have some authority in that situation. As soon as the situation changes, you know, the con chair walks in the room and says, Hey guys, we need this room, you know, for this, can you guys move next door? Okay. We all do that because something else has changed the, so the structure is, it's very, very fluid in real life. Okay. Um, so <laughs> raise his hand. Oops. That's my left hand. You guys, I love you. Um, so, so here's the thing. Authority is about access to resources and it's about providing and distributing resources, okay? It is not about who's the meanest. It's not about any of that. Um, so, okay. In one of the cool, cool little fun facts that I'm just gonna set down and then let you guys uh, <laughs> chew on later, um, the howler monkeys that scream the loudest are the one with the smallest equipment. Okay, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm using Twitch safe language, but you all know where I'm going. Um, those who don't have it are the most loud and aggressive. And if, if you want to draw any social conclusions from that, that's entirely on your own. Um, <laughs> but what I, the whole idea of 
the most masculine, the most, uh, you know, the, the baddest bad alpha, all of that is, um, it, it just doesn't hold up in nature guys. It really doesn't. Okay. The most of the behaviors that you associate with your traditional alpha male, uh, you're, you're reading a paranormal normal romance or, you know, getting really bad dog training advice, you know, on the internet or whatever. Um, those are actually signs of insecure, low ranking individuals. Again, if you don't have it, you need to fake that you do. And if you've got it, you don't waste your energy flaunting it. All right. Um, so this is, um, if I want to, if I want to illustrate, you know, with something that's, uh, if I want to write a story with something that really is in a very effective, true alpha figure, he's not going to be fussing around with every little thing he doesn't need to. All right. So, um, and I've, I'm going to try some experiments here and we're going to hope they get by things. Uh, this is stuff that I can do in an educational context on a conference. I don't know if Twitch and YouTube are going to let me get away with it. So if we, if we, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Um, but here's an example of an alpha situation written correctly. And here where I'm saying alpha, none of these are breeding pairs. I'm using completely pop culture language as, you know, big, big masculine dude kind of thing. Um, and so if you guys recognize this scene and I'm, please let me know if the audio comes through here. And if it doesn't, that's fine. We can narrate it. This is from X-Men first class. Are you guys getting any audio? There is no sound. Okay. <laughs> no sound, just violence and language. Okay. Um, so real quickly, the scene, uh, in the film, uh, Charles Xavier, Eric Lenscher are coming in, they're finding Wolverine and they introduce themselves and they've been recruiting people and they, you know, hi, you know, we, we introduce themselves and he, without even looking at them says, go F yourself. And, uh, and they turn around and walk away. Yes. He swore that is super mild for Wolverine. <laughs> okay. Um, so he doesn't even look at them. He dismisses them without, and then what you have here are three very strong-minded men, right? Like they all get their own, um, they're, they're all in the, in the X-Men universe for a reason. Um, but he's just like, no, not engaging with you today. You're not worth my time. And they take that and, and listen. So, uh, and if you had had a situation where Wolverine, you know, Hello, I'm Charles Xavier. Wolverine jumps up, grabs a stool, smashes it, goes after people. And you're like, whoa, that's a little over the top uh, as a reaction. Very defensive. I wonder why he's so defensive. I bet you Charles Xavier can get in his head and use that. You know, all that. So that kind of thing. Um, and if we're not getting sound, I'm going to skip this and go straight to this. The other one was a Firefly clip, but you guys uh, are, are aware, I hope, of Firefly, which is another great example of of uh, this hierarchy written correctly. And, you know, you've got these two characters. One of these guys is pretty chill and will totally make fun of himself. One of these guys is the opposite of chill and is constantly reminding everybody how big and bad he is. Which one of these guys is really in charge? Okay, you know, Jay knows he's a middle ranker and that's why he makes so much noise. All right, so uh, I'm using human examples because they also apply. Um, but this is what I want you to think about when you're writing, not just your werewolves, but all of your, uh, animal interactions. So, okay. Um, let's jump ahead. And this, um, you can get, this is from Queen Christina. It's a 1933 film, uh, with Greta Garbo. You don't need sound for this one. What you need to know is the peasants are storming the castle. Um, the peasants are revolting. Okay. So they are coming in and, absolutely just overrunning the palace. Guards are giving up, uh, people everywhere, absolute chaos, pitchforks, torches, the whole thing. They're coming in and they're, they're, they're starting a revolution. So here the queen played by Greta Garbo comes to meet them and she just waits for them on the stairs. And I love this because they're like, Charles, stand still. And then they take off their hats. Okay. Because she just is like, okay, yeah, you wanted to see me, right? Very good female 
alpha uh, thing. And again, not true scientific alpha, just um, what, what we're trying to say when we say the word alpha. So this is... Um, yeah, so some, I'm jumping back in the chat. It's really funny in the moment since Charles and Eric were pushy with a lot of recruits, not Wolverine. Yeah, and, and if Wolverine had been really pushy back, it would have completely ruined the whole effect, right? So here's the thing. When we, tr when we overwrite someone who's too obnoxious, too pushy, deep down, even though, even though that, you know, that's been presented as this is alpha behavior, deep down you know that you don't have to put that much effort into it unless you have something to prove, okay? If you're really confident, you don't work that hard to prove that you're confident, you just are. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, this is, um, yeah, I, th thanks Fantasy. I love that, you know, her posture, you, you mentioned, um, I love that scene for exactly that reason because she's just like, mm, and, you know, it's fantastic. So. Part of the reason that I get on such a soapbox about this is like I said, it's not just useless information. It doesn't just make your stories weaker. It's actually harmful in the world that I work in. So, um, you know, here, here we go. <laughs> if anybody has questions on this or needs resources, please contact me. Um, this is my day job and I'm happy to help people. I'm also happy to consult with people. If you're writing a monster and need some original ethology, you know, behavior science for your monster, talk to me. Okay. We can do this. So one of the things that comes in a lot in fiction that we see errors in, uh, is in animals that are hunting and they're hunting our protagonist and it needs to be really, really scary. So we put in all of these things that are supposed to be scary that really just kind of undermine the danger. So I want to think you've just gone to your favorite burger place. Um, you know, you've got your five guys, you've got your impossible burger, if you're vegan, whatever, you know, you're sitting down with the, your best meal. You're so excited. And you've got your burger, you've got your fries, you know, everything, you sit down, you, you look at it on the table and you're like, I hate you, I want you to die, get away from me. Okay, now I'm eating my French fries. And everybody in the restaurant would of course be like, what is wrong with you, right? Um, that is what happens when you write an animal that is roaring while it's hunting, okay? Um, so it's chasing your protagonist and making all this noise. It is a waste of effort. If you're truly trying to catch something, why would you blow oxygen on making noise? Um, and all of those sounds and threat displays are threat displays, meaning I don't want to engage with you. I would like distance from you. Please go away, which is not usually what we say to the thing we are trying to eat, okay? So, um, so let's talk about what we can do with this. Okay. I was just, here's what I was just talking about, but predators do not threaten their food, snarling, growling, roaring, all of those things that say here's where I am. So it's not very good for hunting and I need you. I want you to run away. Um, not still not very good for hunting. If, and so this is one of those things, again, that it looks really dramatic. We, we do it in films because we need something visual to put on the screen. Uh, but especially if you're writing, um, it's going to be much more effective to have something truly terrifying stalking you and you don't know where it is and you don't know how close it is and you don't know if it's closed on you or if it's circled around from the front or any of these things. Okay. Um, I will give credit. I'm not, I did not really, uh, Go with the Avatar movie a lot, but they did get this scene right where the animal jumps out, huge threat display, and I'm like, oh gosh, here we go again. And they said, no, it's actually just trying to scare you away. And I was like, oh, you got it right. <laughs> Thanks. So this is not hunting. Um, if I want you to, you know, if I'm flashing things at you, if I'm making noise, I want you to leave. I actually just had a consult with a client um, today. Um, and one of the things I was explaining is I... <laughs> sounds really weird, but I love it when dogs growl. We never ever punish a dog for growling because a dog who is growling is a dog who's saying, I'm not comfortable with this situation. Let's fix it before we escalate. And yes, thank you. Please give me warning before escalating, right? Uh, if I punish growling, I'm not going to get that warning in the future. So uh, an animal who is growling at you is an animal who is alerting you that the situation and bad is bad and needs to change. Um, if that animal wanted to eat you, they would have already done it. 
They don't waste time on trying to make you move away. So, okay. Um, so I love Jurassic Park. I really do. Uh, I have a 13 foot dinosaur puppet, velociraptor puppet who lives in my house. Her name is Cupcake. She occasionally tweets. Um, and she will go to public events and do fundraisers for charity and, and all sorts of things. And I have dinosaur t-shirts and dinosaur stickers and I will totally nerd out on, I love original Jurassic Park, but this movie made me crazy. <laughs> right? So let me do another one. Um, yeah, yeah. So pointing out, um, uh, Fantasine says, points out like a rattlesnake, they rattle their tail so they don't have to bite you. Exactly, exactly like that. Okay, um, so this movie was full of behavior that made no sense. I'm not going to go through the whole thing because we don't have time for that, but I want to mention it because it's a great example of how we pick up tropes and start to use them without really thinking about them. So if you are running for your life, okay, you don't stop to randomly attack things and then eat them or not eat them. Like, you know, no, no, there's a freaking volcano, right? You know, we're, we're getting out of dodge. We have priorities, <laughs> okay? Not dying is a priority. Um, and then some just really crazy stuff like, hey, there's an entire collection of, even if we ignore the volcano, like I don't, I, you know, under stress, I'm, I need to eat instead of get away. So um, I know I'm going to ignore the volcano, but there's a whole collection of natural prey outside, but I've got these creatures, um, these humans that I imprinted on inside. So I'm going to walk through lava to eat the creatures I imprinted on. None of this makes any sense. Okay. Um, what it made sense for was I want to show off my CG. I want to, uh, you know, have a situation that looks really tense until somebody actually thinks about it. And as long as, as long as people aren't thinking about what's going on, they're just watching and looking at the picture. It looks good. Right. Um, the only thing is here. Okay. Hold on. What? Oh my gosh. What's going on with my screen? I didn't put that animation in. I don't know where it's coming from, <laughs> but anyway, um, just insert in a lava cake joke here and let's move on. Um, what does make sense? is that it was written to sell toys, right? To a, a, a commercial for toys is not viscerally terrifying. I want viscerally terrifying, all right, in my, in my fiction. Um, if, if you were gonna be threatened by a dinosaur, you are so threatened by a dinosaur, okay? I don't want anybody stopping and going, what, does, does that even make sense? So, okay. Um, Okay, sorry, I'm gonna catch up with the chat here a second. Um, please reuse realistic dinosaurs. Yeah, right, I, we can hope. Um, T-Rex and the raptors, the Indomitus made sense maybe because she's mentioned she's hunting for fun. Yes, some animals do hunt for fun. That can happen. Um, domestic house, house cats are, are a lot of that. Um, but you don't hunt for fun when your life is in danger, right? <laughs> like if you are running in terror, you don't wait, oh, stop, I need to real quick do this puzzle. Now keep running again. Okay, that doesn't happen. All right. Um, you don't yell at your cookies, absolutely. I mean, if you do, there's probably, you know, a conversation that you need to have with someone about that. Okay, let's move on. Oh, and then, yeah, this... The, the collection of MacGuffins that went into this plot, um, and we're not going to spend a lot of time, like, again, this, this is one of those that if you're looking at any of this going, okay, it requires the alpha hierarchy to work, which we already know doesn't work. And then it requires like the alpha hierarchy to be genetic among strangers and a lot of things. And we're just not going to spend time there. Thanks. Okay. Again, I, I, I have this bone to pick all dinosaur puns intended, um, because I see the damage this does every single day. Uh, and, um, I see animals get hurt because of this. I see people get hurt because of this, because, you know, people are trying to do these things and, you know, creating more aggression instead of less. And, and it's just, so this is my little soapbox. Um, we're writing better fiction. We're also making the world better. <laughs> okay. Um, I think there are some social reasons why people really, really want to believe in this hierarchy mythology um, is usually because somebody's telling them they deserve to be at the top of it. And OK, like that's the only way they're going to feel good about themselves this week. But honestly, we can do better. <laughs> OK, so. <clears throat> um. 
<clears throat> excuse me. Okay. What I want to do is show you some things that we can do better. Hey, thanks for the cheer. Okay. Um, okay. And, uh, I, I actually, I want to jump backwards. Um, you a comment says zoo animals are all anxious and depressed. So maybe the dinosaurs from the movie were just really messed up from ca from captivity. Um, so, and I, and I can't tell where in the world people are commenting from, but if you have, because again, I, I, I have a lot of friends who work with exotics, uh, professionally, I get to see a lot of things behind the scenes, a well run facility, uh, there should, there's, there should not be anxiety. There should not be depression. There should be amazing enrichment. Um, there is amazing health care that goes on, but that's a well, well run, you know, AZA accredited kind of facility. Um, there's a lot of places in the world that are not that. So I'm definitely not going to speak to, you know, everything is, or everything isn't. Um, I will say, uh, a well run facility um, those animals are healthier than they are in the wild, but, and I may include me mentally, there should be really good mental care as well. Um, that said, uh, there's a lot of places where that's not true and th that needs to be addressed. So there we go. Um, these are the things that we are going to talk about, uh, here where, where we actually are going to do real training, um, <laughs> that it's not just flexing. <laughs> so, uh, Capturing and shaping are things to look at as far as getting behavior in your, uh, in your animals. If you've got the, the ranger who needs to train an animal, or if you've got, you know, the, uh, the protagonist who needs to befriend the, the dragon or, or whatever the case may be, um, these things are almost never portrayed in fiction, which is sad because they are the things we have reams and reams and reams of information on, uh, readily available to you. And, uh, and it's, it's an, again, it's another place where we can just do some good in the world while writing better stories. Uh, so usually when training is portrayed in fiction, it's reduced to some sort of mystical ability. Either you have a whisperer who is using some outdated stuff, or you have, oh, well, they just have this gift, you know, thing. And, and no, we, we it actually is science guys. Like we can, we, we have it available. Now, if, if your story requires it to be a gift, like maybe this, this girl is a psychic with dragons or something, then great, you know, go with that. Um, if it's something where you just, you know, you have a ranger who just happens to be really good with animals. Fantastic. Let's just be really good with animals. And what that means is you're really aware of behavior to capture and to shape. So, um, shaping is uh, taking the, the, the official terms are successive approximations. And yeah, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to avoid the jargon here. Basically it's, um, playing hot and cold. <laughs> okay. So, uh, I want you to go walk this direction instead of that direction. So when you turn your head here, that's getting warmer. You turn your head this way, it's getting warmer. Oh, no reinforcement over here. Yes, I will reinforce this. And pretty soon we're moving that direction. Okay. So that's a really, really simplistic explanation of shaping. Capturing is waiting until your learner does it anyway, or some form of it, and then reinforcing that. And reinforcement is not the same thing as reward, but for our purposes today, you can just substitute the word re reward. Um, so that can be a food reward, that can be toys, that can be attention, that can be access to some other valued resource, you know, all kinds of things. Um, so, you know, if I want, if I have an adorable puppy and I want to teach this puppy to sit, uh, my puppy is short. I am tall. If I stand close to the puppy in order to look up at me, okay, the head's going to go up. The bum's going to go down because puppies are not coordinated and he's going to up, end up in a sitting position. I mark that. Hooray. You're so brilliant. I reinforce that. Have a cookie. And I have captured the sit. I didn't push up, pull down. I waited until it happened naturally. And then I reinforced it. Okay. So there's your tiny, tiny nutshells of shaping and capturing. And, and, and this is what I do all day. <laughs> it's fantastic. Um, so yeah, so I'm just, you know, you break horses by befriending them, not by what they do in movies and things. Yeah. And again, it goes back to authority comes from resources. Okay. I have stuff that you want and I will give you all the opportunities to get it. That can be a food treat. That can be, hey, if you take three steps backwards, I'll open the gate to the next pasture. Okay. All kinds of things that are out there. All right. 
I have the opposable thumbs. Okay, I can I can do things for you. So, okay. Um, and let me see if I can get. Oh, please just play ahead. All right. Sorry, my video my video controls have disappeared from this, so it's just going to have to play. Um, I think. I think the, uh, the temptation to portray training as something mystical comes from the idea that if we make it scientific, then it won't feel heartfelt and heartwarming and all the things that we're trying to usually to get out of, you know, those kinds of movies. Um, either we need to show that, you know, oh, my protagonist is so amazing that things just respect him. Or I need um, this person to have an ability that no one else can do. Or, you know, or I just need it to be a warm fuzzy. And if it's based on data, it won't be warm and fuzzy, you know, is the, is the popular thinking. Um, I'm here to tell you guys, my, my day job is incredibly scientific with lots and lots of data and it is still warm and fuzzy and I love it. <laughs> okay, so, so you can do all of those. So, okay, there you go. And so here, this is me working with, um, this is one of my dogs. And as you can see, this is something that is, you know, we are doing uh, protection training. She is biting on cue. Um, and you can see that there's not, there's not a lot, there's no force, there's no pain. You know, we've got nice clean outs and all kinds of things that are going on. So this is the idea here. Okay. Autopilot horses. <laughs> Anybody who has watched a movie or probably played some tabletop games or whatever has experienced autopilot horses. You start them running. They will continue to run until either next Thursday or a cliff appears. Like this is how autopilot horses work. Um, you, you've definitely seen these. This is frustrating. Um, again, it comes from uh, I needed a cool visual for a movie and it just kept building and building and building and becoming more and more of a trope and everyone just kept making assumptions. Um, it's gotten to the point where I will watch, um, I I've seen things where they just start the horses running and the horses just literally run through walls because I guess horses don't know that you can turn or stop or not run through a wall. <laughs> okay. Um, but we get this in fiction too, where people just get on a horse and run for a hundred miles. No, okay, don't do this. Um, and again, it goes back to, I, it, I, one, like it takes a lot out of your story if you just, oh, well, let's just hop in the Ferrari and drive to the next state, you know, and then you're, no, maybe your protagonist has to actually work to reach the next stage. That'd be great. But also anything that, <laughs> surprise Pikachu face, yeah. And anything that, uh, if, if you have a reader or a player or a viewer who is, you know, remotely rubbing two, two brain cells together, it destroys your story. So I'm just gonna uh, give an example and I'm gonna make this one a little bit vague. Uh, but uh, this was my very, very first Dungeons and Dragons play experience ever. I'm at a convention. Um, I have paid money to play in this game. It was an absolutely horrible experience for so many reasons. Uh, one of which was uh, we were supposed to be, our party was supposed to be investigating, you know, this bandit attack on a uh, horse, horse and wagon in the woods. And what we determined is that the bandit, and you know, we were tracing things back, what would have had to have taken place to justify you know, where we are ending up at this point is that the horses were startled by the bandit attack and ran dragging a wagon for three days and three nights without stop until they ran into a village and smashed into some stuff. So of course I'm sitting here going, there's no way we are looking in the right place because we are three days gallop away from where these horses, you know, were discovered when they smashed into things, um, as you do. And so I know we're in the wrong place. So we need to go back that direction because horses naturally have a flight distance of, you know, a hundred feet or so, unless something's pursuing them, which no thing is going to pursue them for three days and three nights. And, um, and so it was very frustrating because I, you know, th th it was very frustrating for a number of reasons. Um, I didn't roll dice for two and a half hours. My first dice roll of the game, I died because my level one character was attacked by a level eight wizard from invisibility. Uh, but anyway, aside from that, the, uh, the scenario author 
came by the table and he's like, well, how's this going? And, and I'm like, I'm, I know we're not in the right place. I can't figure it out. And then he got really, really angry. Um, so don't set your players up to be confused. Don't set your, um, your reader up to, you know, I'm, I'm, I know there's a mystery that I'm supposed to be solving. It's not the one that the, that the author wanted me to solve. I'm trying to fix something else. So, okay. Uh, what, wait, wait, I'm sorry. I just got distracted in the chat. Rode 500 miles in a day to pick flowers. That is, um, a thing. Yeah, there we go. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I will say endurance writing is a sport that exists. Okay. These are things that can happen. However, it is a sport that exists in the same way that the Olympics exist, but that doesn't mean that I'm qualified to do it. Okay. Uh, these are extreme athletes, both human and equine. They used specialized tack and they have vet checks all along the way to make sure everything is still okay while you're doing it. Um, these are, you know, not, you're just going to hop on the horse that you rented at the, at the local, local livery stable and go out and do this. So yeah. Um, okay. So I'm just got to give credit to the DM for that scenario. The, the, the scenario was written horribly, but I saw in the chat about bad DM, the DM was great. The DM actually tried so, so hard to save that because he realized that, you know, it was going very poorly. <laughs> so, um, so he, he hand waved heavily so that my level one character landed on a healing potion, which broke and it was absorbed to the skin. So I got to actually live for more than one dice roll in the game. So mad props to that DM, but all the shade at the scenario author. Okay, <laughs> so the other thing that, um, <laughs> sorry, the other thing that happens a lot, and you'll see this in a many, many films and books, is that everything is a golden retriever. <laughs> so I'm going to play this video. Um, we don't need sound. You can, uh, you can see everything that's going to happen here. But the idea that, um, and this happens in Jurassic Park too. Oh no, no, these dinosaurs eat meat, but these dinosaurs eat, eat vegetation. Therefore they're safe and, you know, placid and, you know, really chill and not at all dangerous. You know, never mind the fact that they still weigh multiple tons and to totally squish you if they got startled. Uh, no, that's not an issue because they eat grass. And, um, you know, wolves become golden retrievers and cows become golden retrievers and everything becomes golden retrievers. Um, and the guys, not even golden retrievers are always golden retrievers. Okay. Um, so we need to make sure that we do respect the individual species and we need to make sure that behavior makes sense in context. Um, so obviously this is for humor. Like I'm not just picking on Disney just a little bit. Um, but you know, is your animal predator or prey? They're going to have massively different natural behaviors based on that. You know, your startle response from a prey animal is going to be very different than your startle response from a predator. Uh, is your animal curious or neophobic? And th you know, th there's a, I'm so, so sick of wolves as guard dogs. Okay. Wolves are terrible guard dogs. Wolves are very, very neophobic. <laughs> if something says boo, they're like, Oh, great. See ya. Bye. Uh, okay. So match what the, the purpose of the animal in your story to what your animal might actually do. So, okay. Um, okay. So, and here we are like, which of these tool wolves is aggressive? Okay. It's, it's a trick question because both of them are, and neither of them are <laughs> right. Um, because wolves are, you know, both of these animals are afraid. Therefore they're both dangerous, but they are also going to take the first exit that you give them. So you will see lots of threat behavior from these do from these wolves, especially if you look at the one on the right, there's all kinds of threat behavior going on. Uh, that's not threat behavior because it wants to eat you. That's threat behavior because it doesn't want to engage with you. Okay. All right. Okay. So, um, I'm just going to wrap here and I want to take Q and a, and I'm fine with, um, spitballing some, uh, some concepts or whatever we want to do for the rest of this. Uh, here is where you could contact me. I do have a contact form on my website and you can hear it from here. Find me on lots of different social medias. I do stream, uh, every Tuesday night, uh, about creativity and writing. So feel free to check that out. Um, 
and those are those I have weekly themes uh, and there's a calendar that will tell you what our topic is for that week. And then once a month we have a create in. Yay. Anyway, so you're welcome to join for that, but um, always feel free to bring questions in there. Um, so a question of how should you write talking animals? So this is actually a really great question because there's so many right answers. <laughs> so once I'm, once my animals are talking, I've already departed from very strict science. So I have some flexibility, but the more things you get right, the more I will buy the, uh, the, the outlying things, right? The example that I heard, and I wish I knew who to give credit to, I heard the man say this and I've forgotten his name, so I'm so sorry. I'd love to give him credit if I can remember. Um, but he said, if you get the saddles right, they will believe the flying horses, right? So you work really hard to make sure your saddle makes sense in context. You know, how do we fit the saddle around the wings? How does it hold on, you know, when we're banking in the air and all of those sorts of things. And then if I've put effort into making the saddle work, then of course the horses can fly. <laughs> we don't even question that, right? So the same thing here for talking animals. And what I would say is what, you know, what, I guess, personality, I'm just gonna say um, as a shorthand, do you want for your talking animals? Is it basically a person in an animal shape? Then great, just write them as another human who happens to be shaped like a cat. If it is an animal who has some, you know, it, it more language than we normally associate, you know, more human language than we normally associate with that, but their fundamental worldview is still of a cat, they're gonna have a lot of different responses uh, than a human would and they're gonna be more sensitive to noises and sounds and they're gonna interpret things in different ways. And you know, oh, well, you know, that, that person's, you know, really kind of threatening, you know, like, why? Well, he keeps looking at me. He's looking at you because, you know, you're a cat and he likes cats, but he keeps looking at me and I don't like it. You know, okay, so you're gonna get, um, you know, a different interpretation of things, you know, based on uh, if, if it's a cat brain that can speak or a human brain in a cat body. So choose which one, uh, great. Both of them are fine. Just choose which one you want and go from there. Um, okay. So yeah. Okay. Great question here from Cozy Rogers. What are some of the differences between predators and prey in reacting to perceived threats? My first gut assumption was prey runs, barring presence of babies, but maybe predators would do that too. Yeah. So, um, as I just said, wolves typically are pretty neophobic and, um, neophobic fancy word meaning afraid of new stuff. Um, and so if, if you, if they have the option, they will leave because it is not worth it. Remember, uh, if, unless you live in a very comfortable house with DoorDash dropping stuff off on your front steps, you know, every couple of days, uh, how you spend your energy matters a lot and getting injured means that you don't get to find food until you heal. So there is a very, very high cost to risking injury. This is why in most cases, threat is much more uh, valuable or useful than actual combat. And why if you can avoid a threat, if you can avoid a risk, you're always going to choose that over engaging with it. Um, so, you know, if, if you walk in, you know, the thing about, you know, oh, they're always, they're, they're more scared of you than you are of them, which you'll hear a lot of times. Um, uh, I don't actually know if scared is the right word, but I know they don't want to waste their time and energy in fighting you. <laughs> okay. They just, it's not worth it to them. Um, so, uh, so yeah, it, anything that is healthy would prefer to avoid combat if it can. So, uh, so perceived threats, you're always going to see escape as a preferred option. Um, there's two ways of escape. There's I leave and there's, I make you leave. So if I have the choice to run away, that's usually step a, um, because it has the most options. If step a, you know, if, if flight is not an option, then you get defensive behavior. I said, get away. <laughs> and, um, and that is creating distance. I still want distance between you and me, but I'm going to make you move instead of me moving. Maybe because I don't have the option to move. Maybe because, because there's nowhere for me to go. Maybe because I have babies who can't move as fast as me. So I need to stay close to them. So those kinds of things. And, um, and again, threats are an opportunity to end the conflict. Okay. And threats are 
a request, sometimes more or less polite, uh, to change the situation. Uh, so if, if something is snarling at me, I can probably fix it <laughs> by moving away. All right. So that's something just to keep in mind. Um, on the, on the topic of endless horses, they just go off into the distance and they can go all the way around the globe and come back again. Uh, a reasonable distance for a horse to travel in a day. Um, this is going to depend hugely on, um, or, or horse for pull a wagon. This is going to depend very much on your horse, uh, your horse's background, breeding and, you know, feed, um, and your terrain and your weather and all kinds of things. Something to, rather than me trying to give a list, which is going to be uh, whatever I can remember at the moment and necessarily limited, um, look up, oh guys, I love the internet, um, go look up old travel schedules. So if you can find, you know, the, the old stagecoach or the old post schedules, and if they said, hey, you know, we're, we'll be running this, this carriage from town A to town B, it will cost this much and these are the times that it runs, it's just like a railroad schedule. You've got, <laughs> you know exactly how long it's going to take to get from point A to point B. Um, and then you can play with that according as you need for your fiction. Uh, so, oh no, like it turns out we can get there in, you know, six hours, but I need it to take longer. Thunderstorm, roads muddy, wheel broke, you know, all, all sorts of things. And, um, and so you can, you can make it faster or slower as you need to. Um, so yeah, there are, there are ways to speed it up. If you look at the Pony Express, they had that down to an art form. It's also not really sustainable because you'll notice that, you know, they, um, those horses moved really, really quickly, but for relatively short distances. Um, if you need something that's going to take you a long time, you know, <laughs> just at the, at the really, really, um, off the cuff example, uh, both using, uh, the Western half of the, of the United States, uh, in a previous century, but you know, look at how long did it take you on the Oregon Trail versus how long did it take the Pony, Pony Express? Now, those are not the identical routes, of course, but you're looking at months or days, but you're also looking at a hugely different kind of travel. So you've got options, but looking up old schedules uh, is one way to, to research that. Yeah, and don't just, you know, I've, I've actually heard <laughs> really big name <laughs> people um, said to my face, oh no, I Googled and you know, a horse can do hundred miles in a day. And I'm like, yeah, that was an endurance race. That's not, you know, carrying your life's contents on the, you know, this kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, how annoying is it to read a fantasy creature that is a mixture of different animals in real life that reacts differently here? Like most things you can do almost anything you want as long as you do it well. Uh, so, you know, it's, so I have, um, I have a book, it's my only children's book that I've written, but I have, uh, in it, it, there, are, there is a jackalope. And one of the things that I do, because I'm me and I just can't not science at things, um, is we work through how a jackalope is not a rabbit. It's actually a hare and it's not an antelope. It's actually a deer. Um, because it has antlers, not horns, and you know, and all these things. <laughs> so um, obviously, the pop culture is a jackalope. It's an antelope and a rabbit. But if you actually go into the science of how you know what it is and 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 look at it, then we need to categorize it differently, and that means it's going to behave differently because hares and rabbits behave differently because they're different species. And if you're looking at me right now going, Laura, that sounds awfully involved for a children's book. What were you thinking? You're probably not the first to ask that question, <laughs> but, um, but that's, that's the thing is you can do anything you want. Jackalopes certainly are an accepted thing in pop culture. Um, you know, you can do anything you want to, you can have just a chupacabra and just go to town with whatever chupacabra lore you'd like to make up. Or you can get really into the let's determine. Um, well, I, so I spent a long time um, in another story uh, working out the science of mermaids. Okay, so you know, <laughs> because I wanted to, so I did. So you've got all kinds of options. I'm just going to say the very short version. I could have just started with this: is do what you want, just do it well. So sorry, that was a lot. <laughs> so. 
Um, yeah, so what kind of behavior would a chimera have? Goat, lion, snake, a weird mix of all three. And I'm gonna say you have three heads on a chimera. The goat head, the snake head, and the lion head. It's not just like a griffin where you've got one head but other body parts. You have three brains in a chimera. Are they working together? Is it one animal with three heads but still only one brain? Is it three brains competing? I don't know. You get to make that choice. Have a great time, okay? I did write a story with a chimera once. Um, yeah, so yeah, is, and then coming back to, yeah, there's just creative license. Again, you can do what you want, just if you need to do something that's less plausible, spend more time making something else so detailed, so realistic, so compelling that I buy that, so I will buy the rest of the package as well. That's a really good cheat for writing really good fantasy. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm catching up in the chat here. One second. Okay. Follow-up question. If the animal is injured, is it more likely to fight when meeting another possible threat? If that injury is preventing it from escaping in a less risky way, absolutely. It needs to be defensive. Um, it's also likely to be more defensive more quickly because it doesn't have the option to let you get close and then find out if how much of a threat you are, if that makes sense. I hope I said that well. So um, in the same way, I can put this in human terms, um, a person, uh, most of us would feel less threatened in a park with nobody around us and one stranger walking a quarter mile away than we would if we were in an elevator with that stranger in the elevator with us, okay? In one of these, I have all kinds of space, many, many options to avoid anything that I perceive as risk. One of these, I have no flight options. So already my sense of defensiveness is going to be heightened, okay? If that makes sense. Um, but yeah, if, I've, if I know that I can't run away, I'm gonna be more defensive. And if I know I can't fight you effectively, I'm going to bluff so much harder to make you go away. Okay. Um, and I apologize for the author website resources. That's from my, my last stream and I just forgot to turn it off because of the chaos <laughs> today with the power. So get that. All right. Um, <laughs> so, okay. Yeah. Mer, mer people who don't eat fish because they have fish tails. Guys, fish eat fish all the time. <laughs> so you can do that. Uh, so the fight or flight response is absolutely the same thing. So fight or flight are two of what we usually describe as the four Fs, um, fight, flight, fool around, or reproduce. And um, ask your mom, kids. Okay, uh, so if, you know, so flight, obviously if I can leave to avoid a threat, that's a great option, let's do that. Fight, I can't leave for whatever reason, so I'm gonna make you leave. Fool around, uh, this is, I'm going to try to use, in humans, this looks like I'm gonna to try to use humor to defuse the situation, okay? It happens in other species as well. Um, you just see it, it's so easy to see in humans because we do it verbally. Um, we do it physically as well, but, but lots of lots of verbal language. And then um, there's also the, the fourth option, which occasionally occurs under stress, um, but that is not the topic of today's, it's definitely not as common <laughs> as the others, and it's not the topic of today's talk. So. Uh, velociraptors and jackalopes. Yes, let's put them together and see what happens. Okay, <laughs> so um, yeah. Um, what advice do we have on fictional birds? Same thing, just um, what, do whatever you want to just make it plausible. Um, do some research on birds. You know, again, uh, is that a raptor or is it a songbird? You're gonna have some different behaviors, okay? And, um, and just build your creature off of there. Okay. Um, Okay, uh, you hear stories about things like wolves raising human children in the wild or raising any other species of baby animal. Is that behavior specific to certain types of animals? Um, yeah, and let's see. There are, there are lots of stories. There are fewer substantiated stories and uh, I am in no way prepared to get into what is or is not more likely or um, what was probably a hoax or, you know, whatever. 
Um, what I will say is it's less common for a predator to raise a prey animal as one of their own. Um, you know, they, that's just, you know, they're not going to do it. Also like baby animals in nature can be really mean. <laughs> they're, they're, they're not going to, um, you know, the, the play fighting is, is, it's, it is for play and it does a lot of things, but also like it can get pretty, um, pretty physical. And if you have a bunch of wolves playing with a chicken, you know, it's, it's going to get damaged. <laughs> okay. Oh. Or a human infant, infant, same thing. They're just, um, they're not covered in fur. So even play bites are going to be damaging. Um, so, but that's one of the things, like, obviously we've got Romulus and Remus legends, and maybe I want to include that in my, uh, in my story. So I'm going to do as much as I can to make the rest of it believable. And then that again, you know, that I can sell the whole package by selling part of it really, really, really well. Um, so yeah, I think you certainly can get, um, like, you know, the, like the great apes who will, who will keep a kitten or something like that. You know, those kinds of things definitely do happen, but, um, but it's, you're not going to have the family of wolves rapes a chicken kind of scenario. Okay. Okay. Let's see. Um, let's see. Uh, I th I'm almost certain that no animal was ever raised by wolves. I think wolves, Wolves were raised by wolves, but, um, but again, they're a family unit and you're not going to have anything that's not a family member in that family unit as a general rule. Okay. Um, okay. So if there is, let me just put our time. Oh my gosh, we're at time. This is a good place to wrap because we are needing to wrap. Hold that on. Uh, so thank you guys so much for coming and hanging out with me. I do, like I said, I, I do stream weekly and I am happy to talk, um, not necessarily during my stream, but, uh, usually we have a specific topic then, but if you have a quick question on ethology, um, then feel free to, to ping me and, um, and I'm happy to do a short, short opinion or a long opinion. If we need a greater consult or thing, I'll let you see my, my supervisor just joined me here. Um, so we are going to raid over to games GM now, and let me get this into the chat. Hold on one second. I know that is Indomiel. Indomiel just joined here, uh, just snuck in at the end. So I'm going to get her up here. Um, and then see if I can get a raid going. I need to learn how to type and talk at the same time. Uh, okay, so we are gonna hop over and just remember to refresh so that you, you hit the new stream and, and then refresh so that you don't have the rated tag in your, the URL at the top. And then guys, thanks for coming and hanging out at Writer's Conduit. We are here all the weekend and uh, feel free to contact me if you have questions. Have a fantastic weekend. Everybody take care, bye-bye. <laughs>